Okay, so today we are talking about a recent film that I just finished for a local nonprofit. I actually wanted to take you guys through my entire process. And so up until this point on this channel, I've primarily focused on mainly just showing you guys lighting breakdowns or the gear that I used to get to the final result, but I wanted to do a more thorough um, just walk through of an entire project. And so, yeah, I hope that you like um, this style of longer content and that it would be helpful for you if you have projects coming up in a similar lane. And so, yeah, we're just going to get into it. I'm going to play the film here to start and then I will come back and talk about it. The PAL has been an answer in the middle of a lot of chaos that surrounds it. There's like a cloud of hopelessness in this community. And when you have hopelessness, you have people who feel like they don't have anything to live for. So whatever's available to me, that's the only option that I have. The neighborhood I live around and like the people I go to school with, and stuff like that lately, it's, it's honestly been a lot of violence and we got drive-by shootings probably like three times a week. I mean, there are kids in this neighborhood, they have seen people die and the only time I've seen a dead body is at a funeral, but they have seen people shot down. I mean, the most terrorizing types of situations. If you live in an environment like that, where nobody cares about you, you don't care. You start not to care. And so it's anything goes. And it breaks my heart to see that. So the Police Athletic League of Kansas City, it's an after-school program, but it's about building positive relationships. We use sports and activities to draw the kids in, and when they come down here through those activities that maybe they wouldn't have an opportunity to do elsewhere, we get to build those relationships with them. What was true 100 years ago is true today. Relationships make all the difference. Fundamentally, every kid knows that someone loves them and cares about them in this place and that someone just happens to be a police officer. The relationships we have with the kids build the insight for us to know what's going on at home with them. So they'll come in, nobody wants to say, or we're struggling. When we build that relationship, eventually we, we find that out and then we're able to help that family without making a spectacle of it. it builds a relationship with the community even stronger as it helps solve neighborhood issues, it helps solve crime issues. It's definitely been a, a, a positive impact in my life. Because he knows, he knows that we don't have like a, a father present. But they kind of made it easier for me just because they support me. And anything I need, they got me. Pal teaches kids that you can have the love of a family in more places than just the walls of your home. They made me feel like I'm at home. Like they talk to me and they're like, look, like there's more to life. Like I don't feel, you know, abandoned. I don't feel left out. They make me feel like family. I think they feel seen, heard, respected. I just think they feel like this is a family. I'm going to cry right now because not only they've helped me, but they've helped my family. And they've helped me through so much. And I'm so grateful for that. Like, I am so grateful. And a lot of these kids are so grateful because sometimes all they have is here. Because you can't change what they have to go back home to. But they know, when I get up in the morning, I won't go to school, I won't be hungry because we don't have no food. But when I get to the PAL, they have food for me. They gonna talk to me, they're gonna support me. Um, here I definitely feel loved and supported. They support me through a lot. You just feel like family here. It's important that this place stays open. It's important, it is vital to the heartbeat of this community. If this place stops, there is no other hope. If I could take you through this community, you will see. There is no other hope if these kids can't come here, if they don't know, and if they don't have a place to go to. 
they've changed their lives. I would never get this opportunity and it's all because of them. I don't know. Yet. <laughs> Okay, so that was the piece. If you guys watched that, thank you so much. Um, would love to know just your first reaction thoughts down below. I did want to mention that with this being a very long video, there are timestamps below. Please refer to them if you want to skip ahead to a specific section. Just a little bit about this project. So this was supposed to be a three to four minute piece for a local nonprofit that focused on emotional storytelling and kind of getting to the heart of who they are and the impact that they're having on our city. And so um, this primarily looked like interviews and B-roll, um, but I was tasked pretty much with coming up with um, everything else. We ended up capturing this on two different shoot days. If you guys know anything about Kansas City, we have Kansas City, Kansas, as well as Kansas City, Missouri. And this film was actually for both organizations who were having a combined event. And so we needed to shoot in both locations and they were far enough apart where we had to do that on separate days. In this piece, we had six interviews total, plus a bonus seventh interview that actually came um, as a surprise on one of the shoot days. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but we interviewed seven people in total and kind of piece together the story using bits and pieces from each. And so getting started with pre-production, this looked like a few different things, but the first thing that we did was we went and location scouted both locations. And so we just took an evening and went to both locations on a night where they had their usual programming. Like you saw in the video, a lot of that was just captured um, that's what a, a typical night at this organization looks like. And so we took an evening and we went to both locations for about an hour each. And I just took a bunch of iPhone pictures. And so, yeah, I can show some of those up now, but we just kind of toured the whole facility. And the main thing I wanted to get an idea for was just where we could shoot interviews as well as what are our different environments for B-roll so I could start um, piecing together a little bit of a shot list. And so the first, big decision that I made in pre-production was actually to buy the backdrop that you see in the interviews. And so when I was touring the locations, there was not a great spot to film interviews. I knew that we were going to need to film them in the middle of the day, around noon, one o'clock. And with kind of the hustle and bustle of these particular buildings, there just was not a aesthetically pleasing spot um, that was also quiet as well as um, not a spot that had controlled lighting. And so we ended up landing on, in the first location, kind of this basement area. There was no AC, um, but I knew that we could control the lighting a little bit better and no one would be down there. And then in the second location, there was actually just kind of this office type room that we were told um, was probably the quietest room. And because there was gonna be kids running around, we needed to prioritize capturing clean audio. And so because I didn't love either of lo the locations, I did decide to find this backdrop. Um, I found it on Amazon after seeing a few references on the internet. And it's just a microfiber um, kind of photo backdrop that looked um, similar to ones that you would use for school photos, um, headshots. I thought that it kind of matched the vibe of kind of like a youth focused um, environment. I did have a few references that I found. I'll put those up on the screen. Um, I think these were from a Boys and Girls Club of America video, and this was another inspiration for the backdrop. I liked how it fit within the world of youth and sports and felt like it was really fitting. And so, yeah, that's really the only um, inspiration that I drew upon beforehand for creating a concept. From there, I did create a rough shot list. And this was just created by looking back through all the photos that I had from the location scout. And I was just trying to think about the different environments that I had to film in and kind of come up with a general list of ideas that I could maybe draw upon if there was particular moments that I was needing to capture um, because I wasn't given a lot of direction. It was just kind of capture what happens 
here on a typical night, kids are involved in sports, boxing, basketball, and a wide range of other activities. So it was very kind of captured on the fly, but I did want to kind of have a plan and at least come in with some ideas of what I wanted to capture to make sure that we had variety and that it actually captured everything that the organization has going on. I drafted up a list of interview questions. I don't feel like a interview expert. I do not feel like this is a particular strength of mine. I do feel like I'm growing in it, but I just tried to think um, and brainstorm a list of questions. So I will pop those up if you guys actually want to see um, the specific questions that I used. And yeah, I didn't end up using all of them, but I just wanted to have some type of guide to the conversation in the event that um, we needed a little bit of direction. And the last step to pre-production was just hiring crew. And so for this video, there wasn't really a huge budget to have a ton of people involved outside of myself, um, but I was given budget to hire a few of my friends to help as PAs. And so yeah, on the first shoot, I did have two PAs helping me uh, most of the day. And then on the second shoot, I had one PA kind of throughout the day. Okay, so now we are going to talk about setup one and so this is the setup that was in the basement and i apologize that i don't have better behind the scenes footage we really just had what we captured on our phones that day um, the day was kind of hectic and so i did not have time to go back through and capture a bunch of bts on my camera so forgive me um, i would love to make these more high quality in the future but i did want to include um, all of these photos because i did feel like it gave a good um, yeah, idea of the setup that we had and how we accomplished what you see in the video. We filmed these first interviews using two Fujifilm X-H2S's and we were on the Sigma Art 18-35 as well as the Sigma Art 24-70 and we were shooting in 6K, 23.976 frames per second, we were shooting 200 megabytes per second, long gop, 422, and classic chrome. And so I know someone is probably going to ask about that. Those are the specific settings that we used. And so lighting wise was the Godox SL60W being used as a key light. Um, we used a big soft box and then we actually double diffused it through a large 5 one reflector to make it a little bit um, softer. And then as a backlight, we did use one of the Quasar T8 tubes. And this was giving a little bit of an edge light as well as lighting up the background just a little bit to provide some separation. The only other modifiers that we really used in this first setup was a reflector on the left side. And so you'll see this in the BTS, but um, it was a little bit too dramatic. And so we did actually use the silver reflective side of the reflector to bounce a little bit of light back into kind of the underside neck area of um, the shadow side of the face and this helped um, it be a little less dramatic. Audio wise we ran the Sennheiser MKE 600 on a long boom stand and this we actually plugged directly into the X-H2S and so yeah um, from this video all the audio is using the preamps inside the XH2S and we also ran a backup microphone into the other XH2S which I'll talk about later we ended up messing it up but um, we were monitoring the audio of the MKE 600 to make sure that it sounded really good and so from there on this first go around I did the interviewing and so I ended up using some of my questions but I often just kind of toss those out and like to be more conversational with whatever um, the interviewee is kind of interested in talking about. And so, yeah, we kind of went through the whole um, range of topics. And after the interviews were done, we actually did the walk-in shots that you see in the film. And so we did one with every person we interviewed and we didn't use all of them, um, but I just had the subject stand out of frame and I just simply told them to, yeah, walk in and sit down and then look directly at the camera. Um, we did this at the end of each interview and I feel like it really helped um, just with kind of the documentary style look. All the B-roll was also captured on the Fujifilm X-H2S and the Sigma R18-35 and this was all shot at 60 frames per second and the same data rate of 200 megabytes per second long gop um, 422. A lot of this B-roll we just captured in the moment where we kind of walked around to the different things going on at 
um, the event and we did provide a little bit of direction if there was a specific shot that we wanted but this was just me on the xh2s and then um, one of my pas did actually have the rx18 td panel light and i did want to show you guys this this ended up being super helpful where um, we did use a v-mount battery to be able to power this light just on the fly so he wore the control box just around his body with a strap and then was actually able to just hold the light um, when we needed it in the final piece i do feel like half the shots we did light and half the shots we didn't um, part of this was intentional and part of it was just there was a few moments that I captured and there was not time to add any light and so yeah a lot of the basketball shots were just um, with the ambient light in the room um, but we did get to light a few of the shots. As far as those shots in the outdoor garden we shot these all with natural light and we actually just used the large five-in-one reflector to diffuse the light from overhead. I don't have any good BTS clips of this, but we were just diffusing the light from overhead using the sun as our source. Okay, moving on to setup two. This was in the smaller kind of side office room and we ran a very similar setup, but we did have a few changes that we had to make just based on the room and so um, directly behind the camera was actually some pretty large windows that we had to black out just because they were filling in too much of the room and we didn't want the sun changing throughout the day so I don't think I have a clip of that but um, I did want to tell you guys that we did block out those windows and this room was just a lot closer and so you will see that we added some negative fill on the shadow side of the subject's face and that's because the walls in here were like this light gray and it was just the light was bouncing around a lot more than the open basement. We also added the RX18 TD um, behind the backdrop. Um, the back corner was just falling off a little bit into black and so I did add the panel light back there on like 5% just to bring a little bit of fill to that background. I did not have a second XH2S for this interview. So we actually ran the Fujifilm XH2S and the X-T3 and we shot in the exact same settings other than the fact that we did shoot in 4K instead of 6K. Um, I wanted both cameras to match on set and so yeah we shot the first two interviews in 6K and we shot the second two here um, in 4K. One change that I did make was actually bringing someone along to do the interviewing and so on the first shoot day, I noticed that I was a little bit distracted between um, getting all the cameras and audio um, looking good and sounding good and being present with the person that I was interviewing. Um, I just felt like my mind was kind of in a few different places. And so, yeah, for this second setup, I actually did bring someone who was already involved with the project and was there on the shoot day. Um, I just asked them if they would have interest in interviewing and they graciously agreed. And I felt like that helped this second interview a lot just run smoothly. And I was still able to interject with questions or clarifications if I had any, but for the most part, I was able to just focus a little bit more on just the capture. And so here's where I want to talk about the thing that made this film what it was. And so um, you will see in the film, there's an interview from Hope. And that, this was actually an interview that we had not planned for. And so we had already had our six interviews and we ended up kind of last minute the day of, someone came to me and said, hey, there's actually a mom of one of the youth that is here today. And she would be open to being on camera if we wanted to um, film her and so yeah I think this added a little bit of stress to the day but it felt um, because we were already set up it felt helpful just to go ahead and have her share a little bit and so I think we only planned for this to be about a five minute interview and it ran about 20 or 30 minutes because what she had to say was so good and I think once I got into the edit I realized how much of an impact her testimony made on this film and so yeah, I just wanted to encourage you guys with that to be open to changes like this. Um, I know it's not always fun, but yeah, that interview was not scripted. I had no questions planned. It was very just off of the cuff, but I do really feel like it made the film um, and gave it kind of the call to action that it needed as well as the context for these kids' lives. And yeah, I just wanted to share that with you guys. The 
extra seventh interview ended up uh, making a huge impact on the film. Okay, so moving on to post-production. The first thing that I did was go and look for music. And I did this with Musicbed. They're who I use for all my music licensing. I think they have some of the highest quality stuff out there. And I knew that the music was gonna make a huge impact on this piece, um, it being a more emotional and call to action type of video. And I knew that the music really needed to hit and just help emphasize the emotions that these interviews were portraying. So I found a few songs that I liked and I pulled them into my editor. And from there, I just went through all of the interviews, um, listened to all of them again and made some notes and just tried to pull out all of the best clips. And so you'll see right here, I just went through and added little markers and made notes of what people were talking about. And I just tried to make sure and note any ones that I felt were for sure gonna be in the film. And I would kind of set those aside. And so, yeah, before I got into any of the B-roll, I actually had the film complete beginning to end with audio only. And so um, I had the music, I had the interviews that just kind of in the order that I knew that they would flow. And I actually sent this over to the client for approval um, before we got into anything visual, because I feel like this was the foundation for the piece. And if any of this you know, were to change, I would need to know now, um, just so it's not a huge waste of time. From there, I dropped all the B-roll into another timeline, and I just went through and cut up all of the selects. And so, yeah, these are just looking for the best moments. I'm cutting out everything that um, was not going to make it into the film. And I just really wanted to trim the fat and condense all the footage that we captured into usable clips. And so I did this on a completely separate timeline so that it would be very easy to pull them into the actual edit when the time came. As I began overlaying the B-roll on top of the audio, um, there was kind of like one um, challenge that I had to overcome. And so um, the beginning, the first minute and a half, that was an unplanned part of the video, kind of setting context for the environment that a lot of these kids are living in. And we did not capture any footage that I feel like portrayed that. And so I actually did end up using a few stock clips to just kind of fill in a few gaps. And so um, in videos like this, the footage that I use is from ArtGrid. Um, I just have their lowest subscription, which I think only gets you like HD clips, but um, I've never had a client complain about the quality. To my eye, they still look very sharp for being HD only. And so on there, I just searched and tried to find a few clips that gave some context to kind of like a neighborhood and a street and also the ambulance clip um, were all clips that I used from ArtGrid. And so, yeah, if you guys are interested in checking out ArtGrid, um, I've got a link below and you guys can check that out for your own projects. I'm not gonna go into full detail of how I edited this film with all the B-roll. Maybe I'll do a separate video just on my editing process someday. Um, but after I got most of the B-roll overlaid um, with just what made sense to me and the story, um, I did add some just environmental sound effects. And so a lot of this we just captured the day of with an on-camera microphone on the X-H2S, but I tried to just fill it in um, where it was needed just to give a little bit of context to the environment so that it wasn't just dialogue and music. And so once I did that, I sent this over to my friend Jake and he actually graciously came onto this project last minute and was able to help me with the audio mix. And so I really feel like this is what brought the film together. I think having the music and the dialogue and the sound effects all just fit together just right um, really helped this video hit. And I think that, you know, I could have done a decent job myself, but with as important of a project this was, I did want to get um, Jake's opinion, and he is just super talented when it comes to dialogue cleanup and also just leveling out um, voices and making them sound really, really good. The final piece of post-production was the color grade, and so you guys have heard me talk about these in my previous videos, but these were graded just with my own LUTs, and so a uh, majority of this was shot, as I said, in classic chrome. Um, and I used my Meadow LUTs along with the Film Effects um, DaVinci Resolve Power Grade to kind of give these their final look. 
Um, and there actually were a few clips in the garden that we did shoot in F-Log as it was very bright and I needed to um, retain those highlights. And so yeah, if you guys are interested in checking those out, um, I have a link below. I've already gotten a lot of good feedback from you guys of just how these LUTs have helped you. And so yeah, thank you so much for supporting the channel in that way and would love to continue to see um, what you guys are doing with them. Okay, so let's talk about things that went wrong. I made a quick list over here that I just want to briefly go over. Um, the first one was just the schedule. So I think the majority of our interviews did not happen on time with the schedule that I had made for the day. A lot of this was outside of my control. It was due to just some scheduling miscommunication that the client had with the interviewees. And yeah, so I definitely felt like this impacted the feel of the day. Things felt a little bit rushed and we were just kind of flying by the seat of our pants to get this all captured. Um, so that was one thing that went wrong. The second thing was I did not rent a V-mount battery for the panel light on day two and I just completely forgot and we ended up having to run a super long extension cord. This was kind of a pain in the butt. I think in the future I would just um, use the V-mount battery as it made um, the first shoe go super smoothly. And then finally, we had a backup mic run for audio on these interviews and it was running into the second XH2S just as a backup track. And, you know, I just had the level set to auto and I didn't think much of it. But when I pulled it into the editor, um, there was like a super loud buzz. Going the first time, uh, every time. Going back, I would have monitored the audio on that second camera. Um, I would have had one of my friends just put on the headphones just so that I could have solved this problem um, the day of the shoot and had us an actual usable backup track. And so just wanted to share that to say that I'm always learning. None of these projects go perfectly. Um, you know, I'm always trying to make the most of what I'm given. And so, yeah, know that if you find yourself in similar circumstances, just to keep a calm and level head and try and do your best to just push through and uh, make the most. As far as things that I learned, I talked about this earlier, but just the choice to not be the person doing the interviewing on the second day helped tremendously. And this actually wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have asked my friends for feedback on how the shoot went. And so my buddy Dwayne actually informed me that, you know, he kind of said like, hey man, you did, you know, a decent job like interviewing, but um, I actually think that you would be better suited uh, making sure just all the technical um, is running smoothly and that um, Melanie who was there, she would probably do a great job interviewing. And so I decided to, yeah, just like implement this little bit of feedback from my friend. And I feel like it helped the second day just go so much more smoothly. And that would not have happened if I wouldn't have been open to receiving some criticism and some feedback. And so, yeah, I wanted to share that with you guys. If you guys are working with a crew or a few people, um, I encourage you just after shoot days to do a little bit of a debrief and, you know, be vulnerable and open yourself up to receiving critiques that maybe you didn't notice. I think it really helped me on this second day um, get everything that I needed. And so to wrap up, thank you guys for being here. If you made it through the whole thing, you're awesome. Um, I've really appreciated just hearing from you guys on how this channel has helped you. And yeah, I would love to know a couple things down below. Um, first, let me know if you were impacted by this film. Um, you know, you are not connected to my city or this organization, but just curious on your guys' thoughts on how the film hit you. And I would also love to know any questions that you have um, about how we made it. And so I know even doing a video in long form like this, I missed a few things and I can already think of a few off the top of my head that I forgot, but would love to be a resource to you guys. So if you have any questions, drop them below and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.